Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for the introduction, and also uh, thank you to the organizers uh, for the invitation to, to the presentation here. Uh, I think it's very appropriate to have a talk about hybrid photon counting pixel detectors at a school for protein crystallography, because these devices have very radically different properties than the previous detectors, and you as the uh, bright future of protein crystallography, you should know about these properties. And in order to be able to exploit them in your challenging research. And yes, of course, uh, your supervisors, they know everything, and they even know everything better. Uh, but they have been trained on CCDs and imaging plates, and these are really different detectors. So be a little, little, little bit cautious when they tell you how to collect data, and uh, maybe look at the uh, at the properties of this detector. And uh, so to start with an example, um, yeah, frankly, when did your supervisor last go to the synchrotron? <laughs> did he read this slide on the wall of I-24? Maybe not. Uh, but you go there, you collect data, then you read, okay, now we have a new detector which can do 100 frames per second. You can uh, take data uh, with an exposure time of uh, 10 milliseconds and the total uh, duration of the experiment is one minute instead of 10 minutes if you take 10% transmission and uh, 0.1 seconds per image. So if the crystal effects well, you get equally good data with really very short exposure time which then allows you to do fine price slicing and so on. And uh, so this is the kind of information that uh, you only get if you really do the experiment. And uh, <clears throat> so this is the plan of the of my talk. Uh, you should always have a plan, at least pretend to. Uh, <laughs> I will highlight some of the characteristics of hybrid uh, photon counter pixel detectors and then uh, basically answer some questions how you can use them. Uh, I won't answer the question about the price of the detectors, which is always hard. Uh, <laughs> come to me afterwards if you want, if you need one. So, uh, and discuss this over lunch. Okay, and now I think we can all sing this slide together. Uh, this is a statistic slide that we've seen several times before, and basically it, it's from uh, Jim's uh, paper in 99. Uh, basically, it says that uh, variance of a uh, quantity Q is equal to the quantity. Unfortunately, we are not measuring the quantity, but we, uh, the intensity that we are going, want to determine is sitting on a uh, background. So we have to subtract the background, and this adds not only the variance of the peak, but also the variance of the background. And uh, so we get an increased error, and as pointed out several times, uh, during the presentation yesterday, uh, the because this is the sum, uh, uh, the, system, yeah, the sum, um, the larger component uh, determines then the relative error. So if you have, say, a very strong reflection on a still significant background. Uh, you get the statistics or the relative error due to the strong reflection. Uh, also, the background is large. You get, uh, for 10,000 counts, you get 1% error, which is what, basically what you expect. But if you have uh, a much, we are half a strong background, but uh, your signal is weak, then uh, you get, instead of uh, for 100 counts signal, you would expect a statistical error of 10%. But with a 500 photon background, you get an error of 33%. So it's always, as Kai said, the, the dominated by the, by the larger component. So basically, what we have to do is to reduce the background because we get better data, and there are several ways you can reduce the background in the plane of the detector, you can uh, reduce it in angular space, and you can also reduce it in beam phase space. Uh, we'll talk about these uh, different possibilities. So now I would like to introduce the principle of the hybrid photon counting pixel detector. 
why hybrid? Uh, you're familiar with hybrid cars, but maybe not with hybrid pixel detectors. Hybrids because the detector consists basically out of two major components. One slab of silicon, the sensor, and this uh, reverse bias uh, uh, silicon diet is bump bonded to a readout chip. There are small indium boards, 18 micrometers small, and underneath each pixel element of the sensor, there's a readout uh, electronics of the CMOS detector, and uh, this uh, will basically register uh, the signal. So uh, we have two distinct components uh, which are coupled to each other with this uh, indium board, and here on the side you see some aluminium pads, and they are used to connect this device to the outside world. We, we have uh, supply voltages in, we have to, there, there, uh, the data has to come out, we have to control all the timing and so on, and this is in the moment needed. Therefore, our detectors have gaps. These, this gives rise to the gaps between the modules. Yeah? Uh, then if we zoom in, now we look from the side, we look into the... Uh, so the X-ray comes from here, and we look in the side of the uh, sensor, and the X-ray is absorbed. And the nice thing is that the energy to create an electron hole pair is fixed. So it's 3.6 electron volt. So if, uh, so for a given monochromatic energy, uh, there's a certain amount of charge which is uh, produced in the sensor. Uh, by application of this bias, the charges are separated and put into a charge-sensitive amplifier, and so they are converted from charge to a voltage, and afterwards there's a discriminator, a comparator, and we set a threshold voltage here, uh, and if the signal after the amplification is larger than the uh, threshold of the comparator, then the digital counter counts as a photon, and if not, this is noise, and it's rejected. So it's a single photon counting detector. Everything which is larger than the threshold set at the comparator will give rise to a count, and every background noise will be rejected. So in a well-designed system, there's no readout noise and no dark current. And uh, our detector has a dynamic range of 20 bits, and uh, because each pixel has its own readout electronics, it can be very fast. Yeah. So basically it's not one detector, it's the six million detectors working in parallel. There's each little pixel element works like a detector on its own. And with appropriate uh, readout electronics, you get very, very high frame rates and a very fast detection. Another salient difference between previous detector generation and this detector is the direct conversion of the X-ray in the sensor. This means we directly convert from X-ray into charge. There's no light, there's no phosphor, there's no fiber optics taper, there's no coupling, it's directly X-ray to electronic signal. And this means that uh, we have a very good point spread function of only one pixel. So uh, this is how the basic building block looks like. We have 100,000 pixels in a, in a module. Uh, this is about 84 by 33.6 millimeter, um, and the pixel size is 172 micron. Uh, you take 60 of these modules and you uh, put it into a metallic box, uh, put some mylar uh, foil on top, and you get a 6M detector, and you deliver to an ECAT, and the users have to take data with it. And uh, yeah, that's a little bit more, and obviously, because we have very high data rates, and we have to take uh, a lot of uh, uh, calibrations to make the detector work very well to give you accurate data. So, what do the properties of the detector mean for you when you take data? Uh, this is shown here. The comparison of a CCD with a Pilatus, with an insulin crystal, same orientation, same flux, same uh, everything, shows that the spots of the CCD are significantly larger than that of the Pilatus because of the nice point spread function. We see this here. Here we have the blurring uh, of the scintillator and the fiber optic uh, taper, and here we have the direct conversion. 
Because you have to subtract the background, you get much better thing with noise ratio. If you have a nicely confined spot, then if you have a large blur. In addition, you see this is a 16-bit counter on AD, ADC, and this has 20 bits. So here you have saturation, here you don't have any saturation. This is 700,000 counts, and the detector is still not saturated. So, another, this is the most stupid slide that we can show. It just shows that. <laughs> but we are very proud of it. Uh, it's, um, because this is what you get if you take an image of 100 milliseconds with the shutter being closed. And it says zero. Zero noise. Zero background. Zero uh, detrimental effect on your data quality. And so there's no readout noise of our detectors. If you repeat the experiment one hour, uh, accumulate data for one hour, oh god, you see something. But uh, that's good because it's cause cosmic background. Uh, and if there wouldn't be anything, the detector would be dead. So uh, we're <laughs> happy, to, happy to see. Uh, but on average, uh, for the 20 micron sensor, this is about uh, 1.5, about 0.15 photon per pixel per hour. So it's really compared to the exposure time, uh, relatively little. Yeah. So this was how the detector helps you to get. A smaller spot, giving you better signal to noise ratio uh, in the detector plane, and uh, how it helps you uh, because it doesn't have any readout noise, and so you can use this in your data acquisition uh, protocol. This now is what you can do in angular space, how you can reduce background in angular space. Traditionally, uh, images were taken so with imaging plates. Obviously, if the readout takes a minute, you want to minimize the readout, or it takes three minutes with uh, put our imaging plate. Yeah, you want to minimize, you want to take as much data as possible on one image because it takes forever to read out a stupid detector. So uh, you collect everything that's possible without overlap, hopefully. Uh, you'll see later. Um, and you accumulate in angular space all this background because your uh, the ratio of the background uh, of the of the slice one degree to the full width of mark or the sigma of your uh, peak is uh, very um, it's, uh, it's increasing the noise of the background uh, you're accumulating background. So what you can do is instead of taking one degree slices, uh, you take say point uh, one or even finer, and you just integrate your reflection profile over the region where it really, uh, the angular region where it really re uh, reflects. And uh, by, if you do this, you can get uh, improvement of the signal to noise ratio. And we, uh, Markus Müller from previously PSI, now Dectris, uh, did a, a careful study, unfortunately only with uh, test crystal systems because usually challenging projects are not so reproducible. Uh, also, you don't like to give us these crystals if your uh, competitor is uh, trying to, uh, to solve the structure. So, um, yeah, you, we often do these kind of studies on test crystal systems, but I will also have another example. Uh, but I think the general, in general, the, the uh, results hold um, for the general case. So this was done at SLS, uh, collected at one angstrom, terminalizing at the zinc cave. Uh, and what Marcus did was that he took series of data sets with increasing delta phi uh, every time on the same position of a single crystal and with an interleaved data acquisition scheme so that the dose was the same for and distributed for all these data sets so uh, that there's no bias in the dose uh, due to the data acquisition, uh, yeah, this is the data acquisition. And the beam size was 100 microns, the crystals were larger than the beam, different flux rate, and all data was processed with XTS. It's uh, freely available from, uh, from, the, from the IOC archive. Uh, this illustrates the wedge data acquisition, 0.48 degrees were uh, collected uh, each uh, 
Yeah. Data set A was uh, 0.04, then double, 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 and so on, and uh, then uh, the second wedge, and so on, and so we have this com composite data sets where the dose is approximately equal for all uh, the different data sets. And uh, so this is the course, uh, and you get credit points. Uh, first question. Um, what do you think? Is the modality a fixed value, or does it change with oscillation? Yes, no uh, it's not a fixed value, obviously, if I ask this question this way. Uh, so if you change the angle, of the uh, phi angle, the refined mosaicity changes with increasing oscillation angle. So it's not a fixed value. You, uh, there, it, uh, it, uh, it reaches the minimum, and, uh, but only for fine phi slicing. So if we normalize the delta phi of the oscillation over the mosaicity, we see that uh, about 0.5 or so, uh, we, we have, uh, we reach this minimum. But if you, uh, if you estimate your mosaicity with a wide angle slice, you get a larger value than, uh, than the real mosaicity of the crystal lid. So that you should keep this in mind when designing your experiment. Now, uh, looking at the results of Marcus study, if we look at the normalized overall statistics, again, this is the delta phi of the delta set normalized to the mosaicity of the crystal, uh, of the minimum mosaicity that we determined. And uh, here, this is the normalized I over sigma, uh, which is plotted. And you see that for coarser slicing, say, uh, your crystal has a mosaicity of uh, 0.125 degrees, eightfold, and ratio of eight means one degree oscillation. Uh, overall, you get less than 90% higher sigma uh, if you do one degree instead if, if you do fine phi slicing. And the same is true for the R merge. And uh, if we just look at the highest shell, uh, so then uh, you see the effect is even more dramatic. We get about uh, only uh, two thirds of the I over sigma in the highest resolution shell. And uh, so we significantly lose in resolution if we don't do optimal fine pie slicing, uh, which is half of the refined mosaicity. Optimal fine pipe slicing means that you should take your data with half of the crystal mosaicity. Yeah? And uh, if you do this, you can see it, this extends the maximum resolution of your data set. And this is for free. You just, instead of typing 1, you type 0.1 or 0.0. And it's a little bit of this space, but it's not, uh, you can, with 25 or 100 hertz per. Detectors, it doesn't take long enough. It does, it, uh, yeah, so it's really appropriate. Okay. Uh, does it also work for anomalous signal? Yes, it does work. So this is uh, the, uh, the, the F uh, difference. Um, and normalized again, you see that the anomalous signal and the anomalous peak height uh, go down if you do uh, white slicing, and therefore also for phasing experiments, you should do fine pie slicing. Uh, one word of caution again, uh, also pointed out yesterday by Phil, different programs have different definitions. XDF uses the sigma value of the proper width. Most films uses the full width of the reflection. And the ratio that we found is typically between 2 and 3. So on average, it's about 2, most films, most is about 2.5 times larger than the XDS sigma value. So this means since optimal fine pi slicing is with XDS, it's about half the mosaicity, you have to divide most of the mosaicity by a factor of 5 in order to do optimal fine pi slicing. So this is. So in summary, fine pi slicing with half the mosaicity 
improves overall statistics, it gives you significantly better high shell statistics, higher anomalous signal, uh, but it needs a fast readout detector uh, without noise. And please be aware of the definition of the modality and the other benefits, in particular for large unit cell structures, is that you have less overlap. Yeah, so uh, you minimize the risk of uh, overlap. Okay. Right. This was injury, poverty, and lysozyme. And uh, does it work? Well, yes, it does work because what we do is that we minimize the background. In challenging projects, you have a high Wilson D factor, your intensities, uh, you, you struggle to get four angstrom resolution. Uh, if you see anything at four angstrom, there you're sitting on the water ring and the solvent ring, and you have much higher background. So we think that uh, for challenging projects with high background, the effect is even more pronounced than for these test crystal systems, which hardly have any background. I mean, if you do uh, in the with, uh, you can collect uh, in the laboratory sulfur set in 26 seconds, which is the dose of a few kilograms, right? So, um, we have that no background. So, we think that you should, really, in particular for real-life crystals, for challenging projects, you should do this. Okay, uh, this was also discussed uh, in detail by, by Rush before, and he also referred to BC1, who introduces uh, dose fractionation. I just, since uh, this aspect has been in detail discussed, I just want to highlight um, two points here. Uh, as Kai yesterday said, the sigma for a systematic error for something which is experimental is unfortunately the sigma square or the variance is proportional to the intensity squared. So I have a sigma, if you increase the intensity, if you increase and increase and increase your intensity, uh, doesn't improve. It, it saturates. And this was Tyler shown very nicely analyzing some data of some not perfect beam lines. Uh, so it doesn't help to fry your crystal more and more. You don't get better data. You just uh, run into this Iowa Sigma limit. So what uh, BC proposed is to reduce the dose per data set by a factor of N. Then you can uh, reduce this term by N. And the, if you sum the uh, the data afterwards, you get the same signal again. So in theory, you should be able to take uh, better data with reduced uh, systematic errors. Yeah. And uh, so this, oops, sorry. Yeah. So this uh, was presented nicely by by Raj. And uh, now some real life example: ADS crystals by the uh, Yusupov group from uh, Strasbourg. They had uh, very nice crystals, and after some optimization, they diffracted to 2.6 angstrom. Uh, really beautiful, but they couldn't solve the problem. And uh, they've been trained that you need high resolution. You need high resolution, otherwise, you, how can you solve the structure without high resolution, right? Uh, and uh, then they came to the SLS and uh, we discussed it and said, Why? yeah, what are you doing? And they said, yeah, this is how we collect the data. Three, three seconds exposure, 21% uh, uh, beam intensity, and after about 150 frames, uh, the Iowa Sigma already starts to drop at, uh, at 3.5 angstrom. And we said, well, take uh, low dose rate uh, frames and uh, about one tenth of the dose per frame and uh, miraculously uh, the crystal survived and they were even able to pick up nice awesome <coughs> signal from the awesome Heckman uh, and could solve the structure and uh, publish on the top of time. So, uh, <laughs> 
But it's just, yeah, if you do the wrong, you have nicely defecting crystals. And if you do the wrong, or use the wrong protocol, you don't get anything. It's just as simple as that. I mean, you really have to make use of the properties, and this really needs a noise detector. Okay, I uh, was, um, was happy to see uh, that uh, John discussed uh, the kappa this morning. This is the SLF interpretation of a kappa goniometer, we call it Prego, a parallel robotics inspired goniometer. And if you have a detector which allows for, um, for a low dose rate, high redundancy data acquisition, you can use this to collect data in a much more uh, smart way. And uh, the, I will show some examples that, uh, from, from the PSI group. Uh, unfortunately, the movie doesn't uh, work, but well, you just see the space moving around. Uh, basically, what it is, Prigo emulates an arc, uh, but since it's very small, it has a very low uh, shattering, and it also has uh, relatively uh, little uh, collision effects. Um, and uh, so that's very good for, for the strategy uh, calculation for the, um, with this device. So what you can do, is, as um, John said, you align your uh, long unit cell axis uh, to avoid it being parallel to the beam, so to minimize overlap. And, but you can also reorient your crystal to collect on a sweeter spot, and this is shown here. This was how the crystal was in the loop, and they collected data, and they got, they got some anomalous signal, but this wasn't sufficient to solve the structure. Then they realigned, and at chi equals 30 degrees, took significant, 10 times less dose, uh, because they were uh, Pilatus 200 beam line. They got much higher anomalous signal and much lower R factor, and uh, the structure solution was straightforward. Happy users, uh, electron density at the beam line. And it, yeah, it's the way uh, you align your crystal with the possibility to, to collect low um, dose rate data. Uh, also discussed before, you can align your bifold pairs on the same image. You <coughs> minimize the radiation damage difference between the two, uh, uh, between the acquisition of these um, bifold pairs. And uh, at SLS, they do a lot of uh, phosphor set and uh, were able to solve this uh, structure with 26 phosphor uh, sites. Uh, another nice thing, if you have a copper or pre goniometer is that you can fill in the missing cusp. So you, instead of rotating forever, not collecting the missing uh, cusp here, you can realign your sample and uh, collect this data, as is shown here. So you get true redundancy. You get better absorption correction. Uh, uh, you basically improve the accuracy. Of course, the precision will be worse because you collect your uh, crystal under different orientation, and uh, so it will not always reproduce the same absorption correction. But the accuracy will be better, and uh, so also of course, the detectors are wonderful, but uh, they are. Not completely flawless, and you can, uh, if you collect reflections at different detector pixel positions, this also helps uh, to, uh, to sample, uh, to, to get more accurate data. Yeah? So, this is a way to, uh, to take higher redundancy and uh, better, higher accuracy data, and, this, and, and more complete. Yes, this is an example where they collect merged uh, 0 and uh, 30 degrees, and they got higher, uh, <coughs> significantly higher completeness here in the high resolution shell. And uh, that was very beneficial. OK, uh, changing gears, uh, <coughs> all the discussion was about What's the resolution limit? What about the high resolution statistic? And so on. But there's also a different world. And the beam stop is already this bad, poor guy which hides the direct beam, which is always wrong. So, uh, but there's more to a beam stop. So uh, it allows low resolution data acquisition if you move it further away. And if you have a detector 
which uh, has a high dynamic range, you can collect low resolution data directly in the same uh, data collection as the high, resolu high ER resolution. This is from the Nissan group uh, in ATPAs circa, uh, <clears throat> and they collected data down to 60 angstrom. They could go much further, but they didn't do this. And what they then did, uh, they calculated the electron density f f that uh, <coughs> was not in the model, and uh, they saw the, uh, uh, some lipids, and uh, they compared this with the molecular dynamics uh, calculation and found out that this is not only uh, the uh, lipidic bilayer, but also detergent. <coughs> and with this, they were able to uh, work out quite a lot about the adaptation of the lipid, uh, of the protein relative to the um, lipid uh, in different conformations if it was uh, phosphorylated and not. So low resolution data is, can be very helpful and can give you uh, really biological information that is not accessible otherwise. So uh, you should not just consider the beam so uh, something which hides the direct beam, uh, but some part of your data acquisition strategy. Okay. okay. Um, then uh, we also heard about micro beams and, uh, this morning. And there's really a very fast development. People now think that spring age, they have a beam of about 0.7 by 0.7 micrometer. And so there's a race for the smallest beam all over the world. And, uh, but there's a reason for it. There's a reason is that you get, this is in-house data collection with a 300 micrometer source and then 50 micrometer beam and 10 micrometer beam. And you see the increase in resolution. And only if the crystal is anyway larger than the beam, then the increase for it is, is not significant in general. Yeah? But if you have a small crystal, and you often do have small crystals, and more often, then small beams really give you higher resolution. And uh, so that's good. On the other hand, you now have smaller beams, and you can not only design your crystal, and do bricks here, but you can, with a fast detector, you can look into the crystal and uh, look where the best diffraction is. You can do this, what they've done at, uh, at ESF, uh, the cartography of, uh, again, uh, I think it was FCO, ATPAs, and they found out that only a small uh, volume, sub-volume, diffracted really nicely, and they collected data from the sub-volume and got a good uh, high-resolution data set. So what was discussed yesterday is you do a clinical scan, you just average over everything, and you don't use this information, which in principle, with a small beam, a fast detector is available. So you can map the diffraction quality. You can look into and then say, okay, just collect from here, yeah? instead of uh, averaging over everything. And so, yeah, uh, you say, yeah, this takes long, I don't have the time, but uh, with a 10 millisecond uh, grid scan, this doesn't take long. Yeah, you can uh, do a very, with 10 uh, micron beam, 10 millisecond, uh, you, you can take a grid very quickly, and this can be done with a well set up machine, this can be done very quickly. Another thing that I really like a lot is this uh, work by uh, people at Diamond again uh, at I-24 is the effect of the beam divergence on data quality and on beam size on the detector. So typically what you do and you're told to do is to avoid radiation damage insert more filters. Just insert more filters to adjust the dose. But this is stupid. You have a machine which burns a few gigawatt of power and you uh, generate 10 to the 13 photons per second, and in the end you use 10 to the 11. Because uh, putting a filter which uh, generates by a factor of 100, instead of using the uh, beam in a little bit smarter way. And to illustrate this, so this is uh, uh, a nuclear polyhydrosis virus, crystals of about 
five micron beam size, a five micron size, and they collect the data with an eight micron beam and a five micron beam. And um, with the eight micron beam, they have a flux of 10 to the 12 photons. With this five micron beam, they have a flux of uh, seven times 10 to the 10. So a factor of 14 less. So they increase the exposure time by a factor of three. So we are still about a factor of four down in total flux. But surprisingly, the I is the same. The maximum intensity is even higher. And the I over sigma also improves. And what's also interesting is that here you see this is the diffraction pattern of the 8 micron beam from a 5 micron crystal. And this is the diffraction pattern. Uh, and this is the diffraction pattern of the uh, 5 micron beam on, from a 5 micron crystal. And this is 172 micron. The 5 micron beam or an 8 micron beam will not eliminate uh, 4 pixel, almost 750 micron. Yeah? So this is the beam diversion. So we see the beam diversion is the mosaicity of the crystal. So reducing the, the flux what they, they close their secondary source and they also reduce the beam divergence. And in this way, because they reduce the beam divergence, they get uh, better, uh, no, they don't not only reduce the background, but they have uh, a smaller spot on the detector and this gives rise to, um, this then gives rise to a better I over sigma. So if you have the opportunity, you should also I think this should be implemented at the, uh, the facilities uh, to control the beam divergence instead of working always with a, a fully focused beam take out and, uh, don't use filters but reduce the beam divergence uh, for a smaller spot on the detector and uh, for, uh, for better signal to noise ratio ok um, look, but, Oh, one minute. Oh, uh, yeah. that, that's okay, because I'm talking about something really fast. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so the, the, uh, the, we had this question before, how fast can you take data, how short can you make the exposure time, and we wanted to see if the Pilatus 300K, this little thing is capable of 500 hertz, uh, sitting on top of a Pilatus 6M, uh, which can could do 25 hertz at the time, took it to I24, and uh, asked the question, so how fast can you take data? So how fast did you take data? One degree per second, five degrees per second, faster. So how fast do you think you can take data? So, have a look. Uh, this is room temperature data collection. Again, lysozyme, sorry. Uh, <laughs> the interesting is, thing is when the beam stop lights up. This is the data collection, and uh, yeah, this is complete data set. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yes, you can do it. Great. What's good for? But all crap, right? Uh, but we were surprised when we looked at the statistics. So three millisecond exposure time, a quarter of a degree, 400 frames. Uh, with an angular speed of 80 degrees per second. Room temperature data with 100% transmission, 10 to, the, uh, 10 to the 12 photons per second. And uh, you would think all of this can only give rise to very poor data, but it doesn't. Uh, if you look at the statistics, you have 4% in the low resolution shell. And uh, so this is quite decent for such an extreme angular speed. And uh, why do you do this? Uh, yeah, because some crystals don't like to, don't like any cryo protocols. They have conformational changes when you uh, cryo <coughs> stabilize crystals, and uh, in situ diffraction is also a method of choice for various crystals which are difficult to mount. Um, so if you can take, if you can outrun radiation damage at room temperature, this would be really beneficial. This is work by Robin Owen and others at Diamond. Uh, 
So taking data at different dose rates shows that there's a lag phase uh, up to about 500 uh, kilogray, and also that the slope at higher dose rate is uh, less steep. So you can take uh, the basically the radiation hardness, radiation tolerance, the lifetime of the crystal increases. This is summarized here. For increasing dose rate, you get approximately a factor of seven in gain uh, for different samples, and this is also the virus crystals, uh, uh, also membrane proteins, and so on. And uh, so you have a factor of seven, and then if you uh, add the slag phase, you have more than a factor of ten uh, gain in radiation hardness if you take data at room temperature uh, with very high dose rate. But of course, you need a fast detector in order to collect a few frames during this here, right? Okay, and then if you do this, this was lysozyme uh, for the first. Basically, here you see the onset of radiation damage. But uh, for the first 350 frames, uh, this is cryo, this is, uh, uh, this is room temperature. They, they are basically indistinguishable, and you can get 3.7% uh, Amesh. And in the overall in 2.3 in the low resolution shell. So this is very nice because then you can start to collect then you can start to collect data in C2 like virus crystallography work done at time and they have solved uh, more than uh, a dozen of structures uh, in this way collecting in uh, in situ in the plate and just shooting uh, one position after the other, always a few degrees, or a few, a few frames only. But uh, uh, this the high, high dose rate helps you to collect more data. Okay, let's summarize. Uh, again, optimal fine file slicing means half of the modality as defined in XTF, so the sigma, or maybe effect divided by five in, in most terms. Uh, it gives you better overall statistics, uh, better higher shell statistics, and higher anomalous signal. You have to be aware of your modality definition. And <coughs> when you take two fine slices, you can always add them using merge uh, to CBF in XCS. And uh, so that uh, can, uh, also if you, it's a way, if you overstart it because you saw, uh, that the quality indicators decrease if you go to five, too fine slicing. So you can uh, recover part of it if you uh, sum images. And then high redundancy, low dose rate data collection provides higher accuracy data. Uh, and so you can use the pilatus to collect uh, low dose, high, um, high redundancy. You can do, collect high dose rate data to outrun radiation damage, and uh, you can use microbeams to improve your data quality in different uh, data collection schemes. And there are a couple of nice papers now out, in particular in international uh, in IUCR journal. Uh, they are freely available. How people use them. I don't have time to show all this, but there are a couple of uh, interesting ways to collect data from microcrystals uh, that the people have. Right and handle. Many thanks to the Diamond team, Marat, Isu Wang, and Paul, who gave me the data, and thank you for your attention.